Hello, welcome everyone. We're just waiting a couple of more seconds whilst everyone joins. Okay, perhaps we can get started now. Hello, uh, welcome everyone to this seminar, Local Struggles for Housing Rights in the Context of Climate Change, Urbanisation and Environmental Degradation. How do we create resilient communities in the face of multiple crises, including COVID-19? My name is Lucy McKernan and I work for the Global Initiative for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. I'm the Geneva representative. And together with Missouria, we're the hosts today. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Clara Weichel from Missouria, who's also here and leading the, the work for Missouria in this area. And we've been partnering on a project to raise awareness about the intersection between housing rights and climate change, and to explore how climate change and environmental degradation are impacting housing rights, and how local communities and urban poor communities are responding finding solutions and advocating with governments for housing policies that promote climate resilience. So thank you very much for taking the time to join this discussion today. I'll just start with some housekeeping, uh, first of all. Uh, as you will have seen, this online seminar is being recorded. You should have had a pop-up box when you, when you joined. Um, just to be clear that only those who are appearing visibly on the screen will be recorded. Um, if an audience member takes the floor to ask a question, they will be recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, um, please don't take the floor. Also, I'm pleased to say we have Spanish interpretation today. So you'll need to select your preferred language. Um, if you have a look at the bottom of the screen, there is a little globe that says interpretation. Um, and it's best if you select that now for your preferred language and stick with that throughout the, uh, the seminar because there will be some presentation in uh, Spanish. And the interpreters have recommended that you should also mute the original to have the, the clearest um, uh, seminar. In terms of the format, uh, the format will be similar to many of the online seminars that I'm sure you have been um, joining these days. We'll have a panel of speakers who will give their remarks and then we'll open to the floor for comments and questions uh, and then go back to the speakers for their responses. And whilst there will be an opportunity for audience members to ask their questions, in order to save time, we're asking that you in fact uh, write your questions in the Q&A function, which again, you'll find at the bottom of the screen. Um, we'll then collate those questions and um, present them to the, the, the panelists. Um, as the Q&A, the questions will be visible to everyone. This means that panelists can, if they choose, type a response to the questions, but also the questions will be there so that others can view them and reflect on those or follow up after the seminar. If you have any quick technical problems, you can use the chat function. Um, and the best thing is to send a private message to my colleague, Clara Luisa Weichelt. Okay, so we will start. So today, of course, is World Habitat Day, as you'll know. So a very perfect day to discuss housing rights in the context of climate change, environmental degradation and urbanization. And it's an issue that's becoming more and more frequent. Um, with the increasing impacts of climate change, like more frequent and severe storms, flooding, mudslides, sea level rise, drought. And all of these events can have devastating impacts for housing and for related services like access to water and sanitation. Unfortunately, we know that poor or disadvantaged communities are often hit hardest by these events and have the least resources to protect themselves or to adapt. We also see that governments sometimes are using these impacts of climate change as an excuse to evict the urban poor without adequate relocation policies in place. And, and in this context, we also have, of course, the ongoing struggles for adequate housing by communities across the globe. So how do we ensure that housing rights are protected as states endeavor to put in place policies to mitigate and adapt to climate change and that states understand and respond to the situation of the poorest or the most disadvantaged in our societies. So these were the questions that were discussed earlier this year when housing rights advocates from 
Cameroon, El Salvador and Nigeria came to Geneva to brief the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the UN Human Rights Council and the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing. They spoke about their local experiences and their presentations advocated for an integrated and human rights based approach to policy making in the fields of housing, climate and environment. And they presented concrete examples of successful community led tools and solutions in their, their countries. We've captured those case studies together with three more from the Philippines and Peru in a publication that we will launch later today. But in the meantime, I just wanted to acknowledge the really amazing work of our partners who are agitating these issues at the national level and the subnational level. The first is Fundasal El Salvador, Asoal Cameroon, um, Pagtam Bayong from the Philippines, Community Organizers Multiversity from the Philippines, CDAP from Peru, and Spaces for Change, Nigeria. And you'll hear from some of those today in our discussions. But to begin our program today, we have the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing, Mr. Balakrishnan Rajagopal. He's going to offer some opening remarks. We really appreciate him being here today on World Habitat Day when I imagine his agenda is very busy. Mr. Rajagopal um, took up his mandate as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing in May 2020. He's a Professor of Law and Development at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. He's the founder of the Displacement Research and Action Network at MIT. He's the founder of, uh, he has conducted over 20 years of research on social movements and human rights advocacy around the world, focusing in particular on land and property rights, evictions and displacement. He has a law degree from the University of Madras, India, a master's degree in law from the American University, as well as an interdisciplinary doctorate in law from Harvard Law School. So thank you very much, Mr. Rajagopal. I'll give you the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I was asked to speak about what uh, role do climate change, environmental degradation, and urbanization play in the realization of the right to housing? And why is it important to talk about local community experiences? To begin with, I will draw attention to climate change and uh, housing report uh, issued by um, one of my predecessors, Raquel Rolnick, in 2009, <clears throat> where she uh, drew attention to the extreme weather events or disasters that were already, of course, being recorded, plus the impact on vulnerable communities, such as those who live in informal settlements. Now, I share that concern very much. Uh, things have only become much worse since 2009 when she wrote the report. In 2019, for example, almost 25 million people were displaced globally by disasters or weather events. Getting Things are actually getting worse uh, by all um, evidence that is available. The impact on informal settlements and other marginalized communities is particularly severe and is getting worse. As um, that report pointed out regarding uh, informal settlements, the informal settlements are usually located in the most hazardous of sites within cities, uh, at risk from flooding or landslides. For instance, large concentration of, of informal settlements can be seen on hills prone to landslides um, or in deep ravines or in, on land prone to flooding uh, in too many countries. Uh, they're usually the worst uh, land or the most underserviced land uh, are the most risky areas of the cities very often. But uh, I acknowledge these concerns very much and I will amplify those concerns in my own work in the time that I have as Special Rapporteur, but I wanna focus on a different set of challenges also with regard to climate change and urbanization, which I believe are partly highlighted in the report that you're releasing today. First, I see the patterns of urbanization and climate change themselves as threats to right to housing. In particular, I uh, see two kinds of concerns with regard to urbanization. Uh, one is concerning uh, the nature of spatial segregation that exists within cities, um, which is a matter of deep concern for me, a balkanization of communities and a ghettoization of more vulnerable communities 
uh, often in a way that makes it impossible for them to quote unquote relocate or escape. This form of spatial segregation uh, is something that I believe will emerge as a major thematic concern for me in my own work. Um, the second concern about urbanization has to do with uh, the issue of evictions. Uh, even during the pandemic, what I have seen is uh, too many countries are engaging in mass evictions, uh, despite a global call that I put out to countries not to evict during the pandemic. But urbanization itself has become an eviction machine, essentially. The way in which urbanization is carried out um, gives me great concern that uh, the number and the intensity of evictions are actually going to increase uh, if the past policies uh, continue to be pursued. Um, and um, uh, a, a subsidiary concern here is also that urbanization itself is a major cause of climate change, especially if it is pursued in the way in which it has been pursued so far. Um, <clears throat> turning to climate change, um, there are two concerns that I wanna highlight uh, that I uh, believe are very important. Uh, one is uh, something that is pointed out again, I, think, I believe in your report, uh, that uh, in the name of uh, combating climate change or using the excuse of uh, say adaptation to climate change. Uh, too many evictions are being carried out. People are being cleared out without any rights. And uh, I have seen that in my own academic work, including through the Displacement Research Network, for example, in South Asia, where in the name of river restoration, many poor communities have been evicted to make way for you know, attractive development projects. Uh, but the excuse this time is uh, basically quote, colored in green. It's basically green grabbing of land from poor communities. Um, and a second concern with regard to climate change has to do with uh, you know, uh, the uh, takeover of land rights from marginalized communities in the form of climate change mitigation and adaptation, especially mitigation strategies. And here I will give an example of uh, even United Nations led schemes like uh, UN Red, R E D D, for example, um, which are focused on the scheme to reduce emissions uh, from deforestation and forest degradation. Uh, basically, what's going on in many of these schemes is uh, quite troubling, in my view, with the way in which uh, these schemes are actually operationalized in a way that takes away the land rights of many communities. Uh, I believe. Uh, uh, a better approach is needed to ensure that uh, the pre-existing rights of these communities, including the rights over their own land, are not sacrificed and that uh, private property regimes are not created in the name of fighting against climate change, which unfortunately is, seems to be happening in um, many countries, for example, you know, uh, some of the case studies that uh, we have been involved with in, in looking at uh, through some of our students in uh, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, let me turn to one other issue on climate change, um, particularly in the context of South Asia or other regions which are identified as epicenters in terms of impacts in the IPCC reports. Um, and that is an issue which is delicate and uh, has a lot of ambivalence, especially in the light of the history of evictions the, in the name of you know, uh, combating climate change, as I said. But while uh, communities, of course, have a right to remain where they are uh, and should not be arbitrarily evicted, communities also have a right to relocate uh, if uh, the risks that are posed by continued occupation of risky areas within cities are actually not tolerable. Uh, as I said, and as was identified in the report by Raquel Rolnik uh, in the past, um, the evidence is quite obvious that uh, many of the vulnerable communities, for example, in informal settlements do live on very risky areas of the land within cities. And uh, status quo obviously is gonna be risky for many communities if the risks from climate change keep going up. And, so the question of relocation is on us, whether we like it or not. And the question is only 
not about whether you do relocation, but do you do relocation in a way that is consistent with international human rights norms, or do you just do it arbitrarily? And do you do it in a way that gives excuse for, as I said, the eviction machinery that operates around the world? Uh, one last issue for me regarding uh, climate change has to do with uh, the question of upgrading inadequate housing. Uh, there, you know, the question of uh, many issues come in, including the question of transportation, the question of building technology, and then in a larger sense, also reconceptualizing what adequate housing is in this context. An issue that I draw attention to in my forthcoming report to the UN General Assembly, where I suggest that, in fact, adequate, adequate housing should not be seen only as a floor in the context of climate change, which is how typically it has been interpreted in the context of right to housing. Right to housing has typically sort of been interpreted in a way where people say that certain minimum entitlements should be in place. That is a, an approach that emphasizes the question of adequacy as a floor. But in the context of climate change, we should be talking about you know, an approach that emphasizes not only the floor or a minimum level, but also maximum level in terms of uh, wasteful or profligate ways of using land and uh, approaches to housing that are not sustainable, frankly, from a climate change point of view. Um, I do believe very strongly that local community experiences ought to be part of uh, resilient urban planning. The, but unfortunately, what we see increasingly is a complete lack of involvement of uh, local communities in planning in too many countries, which shows that we need rights, not just resilience. Um, so what does that mean? What do we need exactly? Um, uh, we don't have, I don't have the time to go into much of the details, but I would say at, the, at a minimum, we would need first a right to participation and co-production in planning. Uh, participation, not in a thin way, in the sense of, uh, you know, just people consulting people, for example, but uh, people uh, being involved in a way that encourages them to co-own planning itself. Secondly, uh, we need a normative conception of adequate housing, which is based on right to housing, especially in the context of climate change. Thirdly, we need an understanding of resiliency that goes beyond a restoration to status quo ante. Uh, on most cases, when marginalized communities are impacted by climate change, a return to status quo ante is basically what people talk about when they talk about resilient planning. But that's not gonna be compliant with human rights to housing if the original status in which they found themselves was itself in violation of right to adequate housing. What's the point in going back to status quo ante if that was not sustainable in the first place? So we need to sort of think beyond that for resiliency. Lastly, we need community control of resources. We need to have mechanisms and legal principles that encourage greater com community control of resources. Here, I would suggest again uh, that tools exist under human rights law. For example, there is no reason why we cannot use a modified version of the notion of permanent sovereignty over natural resources or PSNR, which is a highly overlooked aspect of the human rights system. I mean, the principle of PSNR finds mention in the very first article of both the covenant on civil and political rights, as well as economic, social, and cultural rights. What's the relevance of PSNR in the context of community ownership of land, for example, uh, and community control of resources? We need to be asking these kinds of hard questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rajagopal. Very um, rich uh, opening remarks to get us thinking um, during this discussion today. Thank you, linking a whole lot of very important issues across um, the right to adequate housing. So thank you very much. I'm gonna turn the floor over now to Clara Louisa Weichel from Missouri, who's going to um, launch officially the publication that we were, that I mentioned earlier today. Thanks, Clara. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, uh, Lucy, for the introduction. And thank you very much, Mr. Rajagopal, for uh, your opening remarks and the important aspects that you have um, mentioned. And welcome everybody also from my side to the today's event. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our new publication, Local Struggles for Housing Rights in the Context of Climate Change, Urbanization and Environmental Degradation by GIESCR and Miserio that has been supported by the former United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing, Leilani Farha, and that has been elaborated together with six civil society organizations from five countries that um, Lucy McKernan had mentioned before. Through our partners from Asia, Africa and Latin America, we know that the right to adequate housing is under pressure from climate change, urbanization and environmental degradation. And we know that more often than not, those interrelations are underestimated or simply not considered. Today, more than half of the world's population lives in cities and 24% of those live in so-called informal settlements. It is estimated that one to two billion more people will be living in informal settlements by 2050. Informal settlement dwellers and people living in poverty are particularly vulnerable to the increasing impacts of the climate crisis and environmental degradation. Often poor communities are forced to settle on precarious land because they have no alternative. They are forced to live at the coast, on the banks of rivers or hillsides or land that is subject to flooding. This increases their vulnerability to climate induced disasters, such as mudslides, flooding, and extreme storms or slow onset climate impacts, such as sea level rise. Although they are most affected, more often than not, poor communities and informal settlement dwellers do not receive any support to protect themselves from climate change impacts or address environmental degradation. Often those residents are not even counted in official census, in the official census and their settlements are not specified on official maps or, and land registries. And on top, and you have mentioned this um, also before, climate change and disaster risk reduction are increasingly, are increasingly being used as excuses for demolitions and evictions of informal settlements to make way for modernization and development projects without adequate resettlement programs for displaced persons. The report highlights ground level experiences from different world regions. Case studies from Cameroon, the Philippines, El Salvador, Peru and Nigeria detail how people living in poverty are pushed to the most marginal land in cities, which makes them extremely vulnerable to climate impacts and natural disasters. But the case studies also show how policy measures and community led solutions can empower those communities to transform their lives and to build their resilience to crisis be it an environmental crisis or the climate crisis or a global health crisis like the current COVID-19 pandemic. The report concludes with recommendations deduced from those local experiences that are directed to national governments, local governments and the United Nations human rights mechanisms. States must guarantee secure access to land and the right to housing for all, especially including the most disadvantaged in, in society. The climate crisis is one of the biggest threats to human rights. Therefore, states must urgently increase the ambition of their climate policies to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Cities are key to improving the living conditions of poor communities and to enabling them to live in a healthy environment. Therefore, states must recognize the role of urban areas and cities in creating a socially just and ecologically sustainable future. They must develop coherent, specific and integrated strategies to reduce the impacts of the climate crisis and environmental degradation on human settlements. But climate risk should by no means serve as an excuse for evicting pe people from their homes. Climate action must fully comply with human rights, including the prohibition against forced evictions. Policies 
have to be rights respecting and include processes for the participation of civil society and affected communities. The only way for policymakers to understand and address the challenges faced by rights holders is by including, by including them directly. The experience shows that well-organized communities are more resilient in crisis. Therefore, communities need to be supported to self-organize, to deal with and propose solutions to the damaging impacts of climate change, pandemics and other disasters and risk. This is what becomes clear through the case studies from civil society representatives in the report. And I'm happy that now we will hear two of them here in, the, uh, in this event. Uh, I want to thank uh, GI, ACR, and all the partners, Fundasal, Aswal, Pakdambayayong, Com, CDAP, and Spaces for Change for the good collaboration on this report. And I hope that it will be a useful contribution to the international debate. We are looking forward to your comments and your feedback, and um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Clara. Um, as you said, now we're going to turn to two colleagues uh, who are working on these issues at the national or, or subnational level um, and who presented case studies in the report. So the first is I'd like to introduce Mr. Francisco Fernandez. Um, he's from Pag Tambayayong. Uh, he's a full-time con consultant there. It's a non-governmental organization that he co-founded in 1982. Pag Tambayayong, which is a local Filipino dialect word meaning carrying a burden together, organizes and supports community organizations for social justice and sustainable development. It's now promoting an urban transformation movement that combines both the social development goals of the United Nations and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. He began his career as a community organizer in 1968. He was arrested in 1972 after the Marcos dictatorship declared martial law and he was detained for helping organize sugar workers of Negros when they were demanding better wages and working conditions. After his release and despite constant surveillance and threats, he continued his organizing. Organizing. He later joined the Presidential Commission for the Urban Poor, where he helped institute the Community Mortgage Program and the Urban Development and Housing Act of 1992, which recognized and provided some protection for informal settlements. He also served as a city administrator of Cebu City and Under Secretary of the Department of Local Government. Thank you very much, Francisco. Sige, please. Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy. Thank you very much. The housing situation in the Philippines, the housing situation of the poor in the Philippines is very bad, but it's going to get worse because of climate change, urbanization, and environmental degradation. Because of our colonial past, most of our, our land is owned by, a very, by very few. We became squatters in our own country. Unfortunately, the situation continued even after our independence in 1946. The situation will become much worse because of urban growth. Our population, our urban population is expected to double within the next three decades. The situation has become worse because of the disasters becoming more frequent and more vicious. This affects everybody, especially the poor. Most tragic is that even climate adaptation programs very often adversely affect the poor. For instance, it is necessary to rehabilitate the waterways of Metro Manila to protect against flooding that is worsening because of climate change. The problem is that it will require the relocation of around 104,000 families who live in the riverbanks. Although a large amount of money was set aside to provide for their relocation, 
only 28% voluntarily agreed. The ideal was near site relocation. Come up with a relocation, uh, medium rise building near their sites. But this was very difficult, very expensive, and very slow. What happened was most of the relocation sites were distant, far away from where they came from and without any livelihood. The families were therefore faced with a choice, unsafe houses or no livelihood. Of course, it is understandable that they would choose unsafe houses provided there is livelihood. The other crisis is the pandemic. Among the first case in Cebu City was from an urban poor community. He was infected and was advised to isolate himself by staying at home. Unfortunately, his home was only 15 square meters that he shared with 20 other people. Despite a very strict community lockdown enforced by soldiers with very long guns, the pandemic spread. It is very sad to note that more than 90% of our confirmed cases in Cebu City come from urban poor communities. What then must we do? And our answer is community advocacy. An example is the Urban Development and Housing Act of 1992 that was initiated by the urban poor and their friends. The initi initiative came from the urban poor and their friends. The law acknowledges that informal settlement dwellers have rights and that forcible evictions must be implemented in a just and humane manner. It has become a little bit more difficult, but still going on to forcibly demolish the homes of the poor. An interesting provision of this law is the requirement for balanced housing. Commercial developers have to dedicate a portion of their investments to social housing. Another victory is the community mortgage program that provides low interest loans to communities to enable them to buy the land and build their homes. It is good to note that this program was based on the projects that Pagtambayayong with Ms. Reyor showcased in Cebu during the Marcos dictatorship. Despite problems, the program is very popular and continued to grow despite changes in government administrations. A miracle given the Philippine context. An example is the is the STG Homeowners Association, an urban poor community whose homes were forcibly demolished. They organized, found land, and negotiated with the landowner. A commercial developer agreed to pre-finance the project as compliance to balance housing. The community association, with the help of Pagtambayayong, implemented the project. Since the project is community-driven and uses load-bearing compressed earth blocks, the house and lot package per unit is only 290,000 or around 5,800 US dollars. And they pay an amortization of $42 per month. By Philippine standard, this is very low, almost half of the cost if commercially constructed. In the Philippines, there are also many good laws and programs. The problem is implementation. Therefore, urban poor communities are organizing to make plans and lobby the government to support these plans, such as early warning device and retaining walls. Assisted by Ms. Reyor, Pagtambayayong and other civil society groups are promoting urban transformation movement. Why urban transformation? Because more than 70% of carbon emissions come from the cities. Cities are drivers of climate change. It must also be the drivers for transformation. The future of our civilization will be decided in the cities.
The urban transformation movement in Metro Cebu combines both the social development goals of the United Nations and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. The dream of our multi-sectoral movement is that the government and citizens of Metro Cebu will Im has implemented a sustainable development plan that is inclusive, that is climate sensitive, and able to address the challenges of the pandemics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francisco, for that really inspiring example from uh, the Philippines. So I'd like to now pass the floor to our colleague, Ms. Silvia de los Rios from CDAP. Um, she's going to talk to us about a case study from Peru. I'll just remind you that Silvia will speak in Spanish. So please, um, if you'd prefer to listen in English, please make sure you've selected English in the interpretation globe at the bottom of the screen. Silvia is a Peruvian architect and urban planner. And since 1998, she's been a consultant to CDAP, a Peruvian non-governmental organization working to overcome poverty in cities. CDAP negotiates people's right to live in inclusive and sustainable cities in a participatory manner and seeks urban solutions to climate change. Thank you very much, Silvia. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Es un placer compartir con todos ustedes, especialmente con Clara y Lucy, que han sido muy, muy, muy facilitadoras. Entonces, eh, iniciaré la presentación. No sé si la ven en pantalla, por favor. ¿Se ve? Perfecto. Muchas gracias. Disculpen que hable en español, pero es el idioma que mejor manejo y confío en los traductores. Eh, bueno, el, primeramente quería compartir el enfoque en que en el contexto urbano que está el Perú. Perú eh, está bajo el modelo liberal, principalmente está promoviendo lo que concebimos como la ciudad liberal del mercado, por lo cual tenemos eh, profundas desigualdades urbanas, la ciudad de los ricos y la ciudad de los empobrecidos como muy bien lo estudia Saskia Sassen, que nos contribuye mucho en esta reflexión. Y en ese marco existe la denominada informalidad desde lo que viene a ser el, el concepto liberal de legalidad. Entonces, la, la imagen que ustedes están, están viendo, diríamos, eh, refleja lo que viene a ser eh, Lima y, principal, y principalmente todas las ciudades del Perú. ¿No? la ciudad de los ricos y la ciudad de los pobres, que representan, diríamos, un 70%, pese a que las cifras oficiales plantean que está dentro de un 43% de los que viven en asentamientos humanos ¿no? y los que viven en tugurios, en lo que vienen a ser las viviendas centrales subestándar. Eh, rápidamente, compartir algunas cifras en el marco de esta problemática de la desigualdad urbana, la imagen eh, que ven ustedes eh, está expresando lo que viene a ser asentamientos humanos, que es en la periferia de Lima, y lo que viene a ser los barrios céntricos, tugurizados, ¿no? O slums que ustedes eh, conocen. Tenemos 1.800.000 viviendas deficitarias, nuevas y para mejorar, que en 30 años el modelo liberal no lo ha resuelto, ¿no? Y como decía, eh, en este marco, el 77% es cualitativo, necesita mejorar, y el 23%, diríamos, es vivienda nueva que se necesita. La demanda, diríamos, actual está en 450 mil viviendas, ¿no? Y eh, mayor, mayormente en Lima y en el Callao. Y la oferta está por debajo de esa demanda, está en 90.000, diríamos, 500 unidades, que lo hace el mundo inmobiliario. Y anualmente necesitamos 100.000 viviendas, ¿no? Entonces estamos 30 años en este problema. También hay 79 ciudades con 20.000 habitantes, ¿no? Que eh, tienen 8.900 barrios urbanos marginados, ¿no? 
la mitad de estos barrios urbanos marginales están en Lima metropolitana. Es decir, Lima, la capital del Perú, centraliza mucho, diríamos, lo que viene a ser el desarrollo, el desarrollo urbano, ¿no? donde viven 7.600.000 habitantes, 4 de 10 habitantes urbanos. ¿no? Y luego, bueno, acá tenemos cifras, ¿no? Eh, seguro que la grabación luego se va a compartir para que ustedes puedan ver esta realidad, ¿no? De los que están sin agua, que es un 37%, sin alta, alcantarillado o desagüe, un 41%, ¿no? Sin alumbrado, ¿no? Tenemos cifras eh, bastante preocupantes en relación al, a la situación deficitaria de estos barrios de este 70%. También en relación a los efectos del cambio climático, podíamos ver según los monitoreos oficiales, ¿no? Las eh, emergencias causadas por los, por los peligros climáticos, ¿no? Entonces tenemos eh, los peligros en esta, en esta línea verde, los peligros climáticos y los peligros no climáticos. Entonces estamos con una amenaza la, eh, latente, como muy bien lo ha dicho el relator y felicito, ¿No? que estemos en esa línea de análisis y de investigación frente a las comunidades vulnerables. Igualmente, acá están las causas de los peligros climáticos por tipo y, y verán que el mayor son las lluvias internas que eh, afectan a las familias vulnerables que están en estas viviendas precarias, en eh, asentamientos periféricos de las ciudades y en las áreas centrales, lo que viene a ser los tuburios, ¿No? que no tienen mantenimiento y están abandonados. Y aquí podemos ver también cifras a nivel nacional ¿no? y codificaciones en relación a lo que viene a ser la vulnerabilidad en el Perú sobre el cambio climático. Entonces, eh, lo que muy bien dijo Clara sobre el cambio climático en este contexto, digamos, de no regulación y políticas adecuadas es una amenaza latente. Ahora, frente a eso, ¿qué ha hecho el gobierno del Perú? Tiene marcos legales, pero que aún no protegen a la población más vulnerable en el cambio climático y en la degradación ambiental. ¿no? Se, ha for, se ha promulgado en el 2018 muy recientemente, frente a las presiones, diríamos, de las ODS, de Naciones Unidas, una ley marco, pero muy general. ¿no? Y ellos mismos dicen, ¿por qué se ha dado esta ley? Por, diríamos, estas cifras. ¿no? que también son sumamente alarmantes y que deben ser abordadas. ¿no? Por decir, el 67% de los, de los desastres en el Perú están relacionados con los fenómenos climáticos. ¿no? Y también vemos otras cifras alarmantes en relación a la exposición de los periodos de sequía, ¿no? de lo que viene a ser precipitaciones intensas, friajes, la gente muere de frío, de lo que viene a ser en, en las áreas rurales, los campesinos, ¿no? Y también en pequeñas zonas urbanas, aunque no crean de Lima, que están en, en, en lo que viene a ser la cima de los, de los este, cerros. ¿no? Eh, y también en ese marco de iniciativas de poder contribuir a lo que viene a ser la vivienda, se han dado decretos supremos para mejorar los códigos técnicos de construcción sostenible, ¿no? Eh, encargados por la misma, diríamos, Ministerio de Vivienda en el marco de la Acción Nacional Apropiada de Mitigación, que es el rediseño de edificaciones antiguas eh, que están enfocadas en general nuevos diseños en lo que viene a ser edificios sostenibles, pero esto, como ven ustedes, recién está en diseño, ¿no? Promoviéndose. Y eh, diríamos lo anecdótico es de que generan programas como lo que viene a ser Mi Vivienda Verde en el marco de la política, diríamos, liberal que se ha venido realizando en Chile como pionera ¿no? eh, en relación al sistema de ahorro, crédito y subsidio. ¿no? Y ahora sacan un producto inmobiliario que le llaman bono de mi vivienda verde, ¿no? Y, pero 
con una perspectiva además de vivienda asequible para los más vulnerables. Pero como ven ustedes, eh, aquí por el tiempo no voy a poder, eh, diríamos, eh, detallar, será para otro momento, ¿no? Es de que sigue bajo el sistema bancario, el sistema financiero inmobiliario, ¿no? Como acá citan, ¿no? Donde las familias vulnerables que están por debajo del ingreso hasta legalmente eh, básico, ¿no? Pero hay familias que están por debajo de los 100 dólares mensuales, no pueden acceder a este a este sistema, ¿no? Y, eh, y además, diríamos, eh, es deuda externa, ¿no? Y relacionado con bancos alemanes y, ban y diríamos, cooperación francesa, ¿no? Eh, que solamente llega a un sector medio y de los que pueden pagar, ¿no? Entonces, aquí está la preocupación y como muy bien decía el relator, en relación a las iniciativas públicas que no llegan, diríamos, a los más vulnerables y víctimas que pueden ser de los desastres del cambio climático. Entonces, es, eh, ¿qué es lo que falta? ¿no? Entonces, ahí reiteramos ¿no? que en el Perú falta la vivienda social, porque Perú es parte de la realidad, de la realidad mundial de cada una de cada, diríamos, una de cada tres familias en América Latina estamos hablando de 50 millones de personas, habita en una vivienda inadecuada, que es una vulneración y una violación a los derechos humanos. Y como muy bien esta pandemia ha desnudado, muchas familias, diríamos, han sido afectadas y lamentablemente muchos han muerto, especialmente el Perú, que está encabezando el, así, eh, el primer lugar en el mundo de tener más fallecidos, porque no tienen dónde vivir adecuadamente, ¿no? Y el lema, quédate en tu casa asegura, para asegurar la vida, verdaderamente es una declaración eh, no real, ¿no? La vivienda social concebimos, ¿no? Eh, con las comunidades con las que trabajamos y desde la institución CIDAP, que es una herramienta para mitigar los efectos del cambio climático en la región. Es la mejor remedio para conservar la vida. Y también... La generación de vivienda social, ¿no? Que incorpore las condiciones climáticas en sus diseños y construcción, un enfoque en innovador, ¿no? Y estrategias como incorporar variables de cambio climático son verdaderamente mecanismos que necesitamos. En esta perspectiva, la población no se ha quedado silenciosa y solamente demandando, ¿no? Y exigiendo, sino han promovido soluciones con gratamente apoyo de la cooperación internacional como Miserior, SDI, ¿no? Y otras fuentes, porque ellos han demostrado que tienen una capacidad autogestionaria para reducir la vulnerabilidad climática y ambiental, organizadamente responden al cambio climático para la vivienda adecuada, sin exclusión en sus barrios, como se ven en estas imágenes, cambiando lo que viene a ser lo que está en obsolescencia, lo que está degradado, para gozar de su derecho humano y no ser parte de lo, y, y, y diríamos no ser parte de una mercancía a la cual ellos están excluidos, ¿no? La autogestión y la tenencia segura también de la vivienda adecuada en comunidad sea una política pública para lo que viene a ser los más vulnerables. ¿No? Estas son imágenes del área central y también hemos trabajado en la periferia, en Lomas de Carabahío y esto es en el Centro Histórico de Lima. Entonces, también en este camino de aprendizaje y de coproducción del conocimiento y de lo que viene a ser las prácticas autogestionarias, hemos tenido cooperación con lo que viene a ser la Universidad de Londres en el marco del de proyecto Clima Sin Riesgo, que gratamente hemos trabajado con Adriana Allen, que ahora es presidenta de HIC, y también con Rita Lambert, ¿no? Donde hemos aprendido nosotros los técnicos del equipo del CIDAP y con las comunidades a lo que viene a ser el mapeo participativo, ¿no? Que los invito a visitar esta página para mayor detalles, ¿no? Y en este marco de aprendizajes para visibilizar 
y, e incidir en las políticas públicas, también con las comunidades hemos eh, manejado y seguimos manejando la plataforma nacional que existe, que se llama SIGRID, que es el Sistema de Información Geográfica para la Reducción, digamos, de Desastres. Y acá ven estos eh, puntos de color eh, violeta, son imágenes que hemos colocado de los riesgos que tienen, en este caso, estas comunidades del Centro Histórico de Lima frente al desborde de los ríos. ¿no? Seguimos utilizando eh, lo positivo de esta plataforma nacional, es que eh, nos permite colocar desde la sociedad civil, diríamos, estos diríamos, este, puntos de alarma para que ellos tengan en cuenta. Bueno, cuando publicamos estas imágenes para ser atendidos, bueno, se comunicaron con las comunidades, pero lo que viene a ser la obra civil para el reforzamiento aún está pendiente desde, desde 2017. ¿no? Y también, para ir terminando, porque sé que el tiempo es corto, tenemos un sistema como las, con las comunidades, ¿no? que es el sistema de alertas comunitarias en el Centro Histórico de Lima, como se ve acá en esta imagen, ¿no? Y también eh, la alerta Lomas de Carabilla con las comunidades, con eh, el aplicativo WhatsApp, que ellos manejan muy bien, ¿no? Bueno, los que tienen eh, teléfono móvil, con el cual nos comunicamos diariamente frente a sus necesidades urbanas, frente a las amenazas del cambio climático, ¿No? Y hay un grupo, diríamos, eh, fortalecido, empoderado, que gracias a SDI en la campaña Conoce tu Ciudad, como ven acá en la imagen, ¿no? se tiene, diríamos, eh, líderes ¿no? empoderados que sirven para promover lo que viene a ser eh, la respuesta y el camino a lo que viene a ser la resiliencia urbana. Bueno, esto es lo que queríamos comportar, compartir con ustedes y espero los motiven a tener preguntas, comentarios para tener una mejora en lo que viene a ser las prácticas en la ciudad de Lima. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Silvia, for that really interesting example from Peru. Um, I was really interested, particularly in the participative ma mapping example that you gave. Um, as you said, we, we would welcome questions and comments from people. So I just remind um, those watching that they can put their comments or questions in the Q&A and um, we'll use those for later on when we open the floor for further discussion. There'll also be an opportunity at the very end of the webinar, um, a comments box will pop up when you, when you leave and um, you'll be able to leave comments and feedback there as well to continue the discussion. So we are running short on time, so I'll move straight away to the next presenter. It's uh, Ms. Dunya Kraus from uh, the UN Research Institute for Social Development. She is a research officer there and leads UNRIS's work on climate justice with a focus on just transition to low carbon development and transformative ad adaptation to climate change in coastal cities. She coordinates the Just Transition Research Collaborative and she co-authored its 2019 report Climate Justice from Below, Local Struggles for Just Transitions. Dunya also co-edited the volume Just Transitions, Social Justice in the Shift Towards a Low Carbon World. She's a, ge a geographer by training and has previously worked at the United Nations University Institute for Environment and Human Security and with the United Nations Environment Program. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Lucy. Uh, thank you also to Clara and both of your organizations for inviting me and UNRIS to be part of this uh, important conversation. Um, in many ways, I mean, you asked me to offer reflections and in many ways, I think I can only echo what um, has already been said because your, your report and the presentation today gave us uh, really interesting and rich examples of a pattern that we unfortunately find in quite a lot of our own research at UNRIS as well. That is a pattern in which almost regardless of where the examples come from, housing and land rights are at the heart of the struggle for sustainability and justice. And if we think of housing rights in the context of informality, we know climate change and environmental degradation make a lot of things harder. 
We can think of the storms and floods destroying stilt houses along rivers and canals that are such a prominent feature of many developing cities. We can also think of extreme heat and poor ventilation in conjunction with inadequate water and sanitation, which is problematic in itself, but catastrophic during a pandemic. But in many cities, we need to also recognize that people in informal settlements are not only exposed to climate and weather related extremes, but to the effects of urbanization and that we live in a world that builds cities for the affluent rather than cities for all of the residents, unfortunately. A second bigger point I wanted to make is that people don't only face the impacts of the climate crisis and environmental degradation itself, but very often also the impacts of a whole range of policies and practices that aim to tackle climate change, but fail to adopt the rights-based approach. So as a result, we often see the examples of green grabbing mentioned by the Special Rapporteur, where green economy or renewable energy projects displace people and violate customary land rights, and often also the rights of indigenous peoples. We see it as well in a range of climate change adaptation projects that use rising sea levels and urban flooding to justify the eviction and relocation of informal settlements, as presented in the Philippines case study, but true for so many developing cities around the world. I thought the reflection of the special rapporteur on uh, a right to relocate was actually quite interesting because I think it's very important to make the point that forced resettlement should be an option of last resort. But maybe we do need to expand our understanding and also see that a right to relocation to safer grounds should be included in our efforts. The fact that we can so easily come up with a whole range of examples that violate housing rights points to the importance of your work and the efforts to demand the guarantee of secure access to land and the right to housing. I can really only echo the points you raised on making forced resettlement an option of last resort and that it must not be carried out without people's participation in the process. The community-based examples you introduce in the report highlights that while we might not yet have found a perfect solution, a different approach is possible when there's political will. I think uh, the report makes a very valuable contribution and also reminds us that what we're demanding here is first and foremost for governments to take their responsibilities laid out in international human rights law seriously. Unfortunately, we do live in a world in which we see countries sign onto all kinds of ambitious and important international agendas to tackle climate change and social justice, only to then turn around and do something not at all aligned with those commitments. Therefore, I think the point you make on demanding coherent and rights respecting strategies to reduce the impacts of the climate crisis on human settlements is really crucial because we still see so many silo approaches that are rooted in an overall global political economy that prioritizes profit orientation and economic growth over environmental and social objectives. So the change that we need to see in order to undo all of that is unfortunately not at all trivial and will require the continued efforts of civil society and initiatives like your own to demand transformation. Too many policies dealing with climate change still treat it as an environmental crisis rather than a crisis of social justice and are entirely ignorant of human rights obligations as well as international policy recommendations on social protections, etc. So in closing, just let me say that I really appreciate your work. I hope that it will get read very widely so that it can reach uh, also the people responsible for climate policy and urban development uh, in international negotiations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Junya, for those reflections. It's interesting we're starting to hear the same themes, I think, coming through many of the, the presentations. Um, so we will turn now to our final speaker um, from UN Habitat, which is, of course, the UN agency uh, whose mandate is most relevant to the right to adequate housing. Um, I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Robert Lewis Lettington. I'm not seeing him on the screen. Oh, no, there. Yes. Well, <laughs> Sorry, that was my... the background lurking away. <laughs> Sorry. So um, can I introduce um, Robert? He's the chief of the land, housing and shelter section at UN Habitat. He has more than 20 years professional experience, including field experience in more than 50 countries in the areas of land management, human rights and rule of law, urban development, legislative drafting, intellectual property rights and information management, digital governance, environment, and natural resources and international trade. It's a very broad area. Robert is secretary to the drafting committee of the UN Habitat 
uh, Assembly and was Vice Chair of the International Telecommunication Union's focus group on data processing and management to support the Internet of Things and sm smart cities and communities. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I suppose is was the case with uh, many lawyers. Probably you've had the experience yourself. We tend to to get pulled into all kinds of different subjects, um, and I think this is always particularly relevant when one's talking about land and housing, because they sit at the nexus of so many other different issues. As we are placing the emphasis today on the social and environmental. But as the comments are highlighting, the finance side also becomes a central question. And then housing is the is a major determinant of all kinds of other outcomes from mental health to economic well-being to, to all sorts. So I think um, being able to pull on these different angles and look at what the implications are is always important. Um, first and foremost, Looking at the, the report, the thing that particularly struck me, which the report helps with a lot, is to remember that participation and the ability to achieve redress in any situation are fundamental to a human right in whichever way you look at that, whether it's in structural terms, in process terms or in outcome terms. You, you can't achieve the fundamental right unless, firstly, people have an ability to shape how that should be experienced in their context. And secondly, if they have the ability to do something about it when it isn't shaped in those terms. Um, when I was thinking about the, the, these different dimensions of, of how to approach uh, any given human right and including the right to adequate housing, uh, one of the, the earlier speakers comments struck me. Um, there was a comment that, that in, in a particular country, there were many good laws, but they weren't implemented. Um, as predominantly a drafter by trade, th this is something I've always, I have to admit, sort of fought back up against. I, I very much appreciate the, the panelists' gracious approach to their government's efforts, but I still have to, to, to come back to the point that a good law alone isn't good enough. Um, that's a structural dimension, and it's a structural dimension in isolation. If it isn't backed up with process, you know, basically a full governmental commitment, and in budgetary terms, in administrative terms, and in other ways, and then also ultimately with a positive outcome, does it work, then it shouldn't be considered a good law. It should be reviewed, and it shouldn't be left in place to, to become what some would call a zombie. Um, that is a dead law that can suddenly catch the unaware by surprise in the future by creating roadblocks or process restrictions. So I think we must be, even though I am a drafting lawyer, I would say we must be ready to challenge and question law if it's not doing what we want it to do. If the outcome isn't there, we need to look for other ways. Similarly, on, on the question of participation, um, within Habitat, there was a point that was made around planning and saying that many planning laws are, well, I, I paraphrase, I think, I don't want to misquote the, the reference, but I think at the end of the day, we're saying many planning laws or planning systems are not really fit for purpose. Um, we see this a lot in Habitat. You can talk about participatory planning, but participatory planning, the way it's often implemented, isn't enough. Um, as the Professor Rajagopal said, you know, it needs to be more than a thin way. It's only really participation if there is a clear ability to influence the outcome of the discussion, not just to be heard somewhere along the way. So that level of participation, I think, is critical. Um, and I think that shows in the case studies. If you look through the case studies in, in, the, in the report, it's all very, the success stories are all fundamentally characterized by the ability of communities to take control of their own destinies. Yes, to work within wider frameworks and to be supported and encouraged by others, but ultimately they are creating the space to say what their own future should be 
in a way that cooperates with the wider societies they exist in. And I think these are the kinds of solutions we need to be focused on. So I'm very grateful to see this kind of report there to, to reinforce those income outcomes. I, I don't want to dwell too much, particularly, I mean, recognizing there's some time pressure, but a lot of the very good points have already been made. But this issue of vulnerability and risk it is critical to a rights dimension as well and, and can't be repeated often enough. There is an obvious causation going on here that risk is increasing due to the impact of climate change. And there are particular members and groups in society who are more vulnerable to risk. So therefore, as the risk increases, it tends to disproportionately fall upon them. And yet, at the same time, these are not generally communities or groups that are very able to, to have a significant influence on climate change solutions and climate change options. They are ones who are very much subject to decisions and, and events that occur elsewhere. Um, and I think that very much becomes a human rights issue at, at both a macro and a micro level. At a macro level, we have to consider the fact that these situations are the result of a combination of structural inequalities. These communities are facing the greatest challenges for quite specific reasons that are built within the way our societies are structured. And we need to be able not just to look at the immediate solution, but look at why is it we are facing that challenge and what can we do about that in the future. But then the immediate challenge and the micro level because the way we assess risk and the way we look at the implementation of mitigation measures are fundamentally going to be affected by power relationships. And if we are to take a genuinely human rights-based approach, we have to look at how those relate to, to different communities and different groups within those communities, youth, women, indigenous populations, or whichever other groups may be present facing particular challenges in the society. So I think, you know, again, to look at those things, I think the case studies in the report highlight a lot of these issues. And even more importantly, they highlight solutions. They're not just providing a list of problems and a list of complaints. They're coming forward and saying, here was a challenge and here's what we did about it and here's what worked and here's where it hasn't necessarily worked as well. I think these elements are very, very positive. They show that communities can find ways to work through their challenges and that there are some places where it's more difficult than others and support may be needed. Those communicate very well at a global level because not all communities have found these solutions. Others are in need of the options to be identified for them or to give them inspiration of what they might try. Some others may actually have an idea of what the solution is, but they need the encouragement and the support and the belief in themselves that they can do it. And to say that the rest, that there are, if not the rest of the world, there are a lot of people out there who really do support them and want to see them succeed. Um, finally, just a, a couple of other things. I, I think uh, the, the recognition that comes throughout the discussions and in the report itself, is something that the both the former special reporter Leilani, who provided the introduction to the report, and Professor Rajagopal now are very keen to emphasize this issue that housing is not a commodity question. It's not a question of trading and assets, and a question if we can shift around the capital, then the problem will be solved. It is something that is much more closely related to human identity and human dignity than that. And we need to be able to look beyond that commodity issue. Um, particularly, again, to come back to the point of housing as being at a nexus. Housing is a first determinant of so many other issues. I was just re reading yesterday the, a report on the relationship between housing and child poverty. And in the country that the case study was studying, they estimate that 30 to 40% of child poverty in that country is determined by the accessibility and affordability of housing. Child poverty creates a whole load of societal outcomes in 20, 30 years, whether they, it creates health outcomes, economic outcomes, education outcomes, and housing is the starting point for that. If we can get that right, and if we can work on it, then we can really start changing some things at a more profound level. 
this ties in again to the question of, of social protection schemes. Um, there are a whole load of different solutions that have been suggested. These need to be explored, but above all, they need to be implemented consistently and fairly and judged above all in terms of their outcomes. And coming back to the same point as with legal frameworks, we need to, if they're not delivering what we want, we need to review them and change them and improve them and keep working at that, not sit and say, this is just too hard and we're not going to do it. And this becomes even, all of this becomes even more important as we sit in the situation of COVID. COVID is a massive global challenge and that is cre creating fundamental difficulties in terms of poverty, in terms of housing outcomes and related issues. But it also creates a great opportunity in that it says, one, we genuinely are a global community, globally and within countries. The outcome for one part of society fundamentally affects the rest of society. If the poorest in our society suffer and fall vulnerable to COVID, the rich will also be hit by that because the, the virus will be maintained, it will spread further. So we need good outcomes for everybody in everybody's collective interest. And the other thing is it, COVID has clearly shown we can make fundamental change if we need to. Several countries have almost overnight eradicated homelessness. We have instituted bans on evictions that people said because of property rights could never be done. We've done it. They may be on shaky ground in many cases at the moment and need, need a longer duration, but it can be done. And I think the current crisis has shown the, the possibilities that are there. So I think I, I would like to just leave it on that positive note and to really congratulate all of the presenters for the, for the wonderful examples that they brought forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, really important points there about um, you know the need to address underlying structural inequalities. Um, I really appreciated your comments in relation to the importance of being able to claim rights um, and of rights accountability. Um, and also for leaving us on a positive note, <laughs> always appreciated. Um, we're gonna now open up to comments and questions from the floor as promised. Uh, we have about 20 minutes, a little bit less. Um, so probably we will only have time for one round of, of comments and questions from the floor. I hope you've already put your questions into the, the Q&A um, section. Um, I've, I've had a couple of requests for the floor already, so we will go straight to them and then I will hand over to Clara who might um, read out a couple of extra questions and then we will go back to panelists. Um, so first of all, we had a request of the floor from Habitat International Coalition, obviously a very important um, non-governmental organization in this in this area. It's Ms. Adriana Allen, who's the president of HIC. Um, you have the floor, thank you. Adriana, can you speak? I can, yeah. yeah. Is that okay now? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, I will be brief, I promise. Uh, I can see many important questions here. Uh, I just want to take um, just a few minutes, first of all, to congratulate uh, all involved, Lucy, Clara, and everyone, all the contributors uh, for this uh, very timely and, uh, and bold report. And, and I just want to highlight, I had the opportunity to read it a few days ago, and I recommend that everyone does, uh, and I hope it's widely read uh, beyond this event. Uh, but I want to highlight three particular aspects uh, where I think that there are very important messages, uh, which are very strongly aligned with, uh, with the coalition, with Habitat uh, International Coalition's view uh, on how is that this intersection between housing rights and climate justice, I would say, uh, works and where is that we need to focus. I, I think that the first point is that is very important and very well done in the report is that it is in reminding us that climate change is entangled with multiple risk drivers that produce cycles of risk uh, accumulation and unequal exposure. So it's not just obviously one event, um, a hurricane and, uh, and so on, as we know, uh, but the accumulation 
uh, of these cycles that really explains a lot about the type of urbanization processes that we are undergoing, the idea of urbanization uh, in risk. And if anything, I think that COVID-19 has highlighted many of these connections and the fact uh, in this case that we are not just living through a pandemic, but a syndemic. That is a condition where different health burdens in this case are aggregate, aggregated and augmented. The report does, I think, uh, uh, an excellent job at showing us what are, how is that uh, the continuum of impacts in this interaction, in, intersection, sorry, manifest. And I think that is really good to see that um, it's, it's definitely about the massive displacement affecting the right to housing of millions of people, but it's also the criminalization of tenants and the very, very tough conditions that homeless people have to face, you know, uh, under extreme, uh, 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 temperature conditions, uh, just to name a few. A second point that I think is very important is the emphasis on reminding us that there is nothing natural about these processes. And we know that climate change has been produced by human activity. But what I find particularly valuable here is how the contributors take us to consider not just the impacts of a change in climate, but the negative impacts of the actions adopted to presumably tackle climate change through mitigation and adaptation measures. And several things have been said here, but I think that we, this is really important. Uh, I think that the report highlights again how the impact of the actions to tackle uh, climate change uh, are quite um, uh, negative on the housing rights in two particular ways. Uh, on the one hand, first, we can see that this connection happens through the heavy contribution of the construction sector to global emissions, which adds another layer of challenges to how housing deficits and the maintenance of existing social housing are approaching. Approach. And this, I think, urges us to explore ways not just of building better, but of retrofitting, repairing, rehabilitating and redeploying existing housing stocks. We need to, we need to really think seriously about this question. The second way in which the report invites us to rethink climate action is by, of course, contesting the massive evictions that are taking place in the name of risk, something that the special rapporteur highlighted very clearly. Uh, and, and, and we now see even the notion of benevolent evictions, uh, uh, trying to describe uh, this uh, machine uh, of evictions that happens in the name of risk and presumably to protect uh, um, uh, to protect uh, uh, dwellers and citizens, but in fact, uh, to make place in the city for a speculative real estate development. Just to conclude, I want to just highlight a third point, which I think that is very important, uh, which is the, the fact that all the contributors really make the most in demonstrating how and why is that community-led approaches to housing are fundamental to the realization of the right to housing, and at the same time, to addressing climate change mitigation and adaptation. From the Cradle of Peace project in El Salvador, through many other inspiring examples across Cameroon, Philippines, Peru, and Nigeria, we can see how community-led action looks like, but also what it can achieve and under what circumstances. So to conclude, I think that the most fundamental message here on the table has to do with the fact that climate justice and housing justice are deeply interdependent. In other words, they, one cannot be pursued without the other. And grassroots actions in this regard is key to get this crucial connection right. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Adriana. Uh, the second comment or question is from Mr. Rio Hada. He works at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I give you the floor, Rio. Uh, Rio Hada, are you in the audience? Can you, if you are, raise the blue hand so that I can find you here in the list of participants, please? Clara, I don't, are you talking? Because I can't hear you, if others can. You can't hear me? No. <laughs> Is Rio not able to take the floor directly? I don't find him in the list of participants. Ah, OK. So um, yeah, if he's not here. Okay, Clara can hear. Can everybody else hear me? Yes. Okay. 
So Lucy, um, okay, do you hear go me? Go ahead, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I think we should go to the next uh, comment from the floor then. Okay, thank you. Well, we also have a comment from the floor from Mr. Cesar Ottolini, who is uh, a representative of the International Alliance of Inhabitants. Thank you, Cesar. Hola. Go ahead. Buen día y gracias para la invitación. Es una ocasión importante esta para ver lo que pasa en el mundo, o sea, cómo las organizaciones populares intentan proponer y actuar soluciones. Han presentado, pues el informe es muy interesante. Eh, quisiera destacar algún punto sobre, no sobre la fortaleza, sino sobre la debilidad de enfocar una política contra los efectos nefastos de la crisis climática eh, solamente en los casos. Es decir, si no juntamos en el tema de lucha contra la crisis climática, no solamente el tema de enfoque de derechos humanos, sino también el tema redistribución de los recursos, redistribución de las riquezas, es bastante difícil entender cómo va a ser posible cambiar verdaderamente. Ahora, con la pandemia, se ha abierto un portal histórico. Es una ocasión única. Alguien ha dicho, nunca antes hubiéramos pensado la, pos la posibilidad de cero desalojos. ¿no? Hoy, este mes, es el mes cero desalojos en todo el mundo. La Alianza Internacional de Habitantes está coordinando distintas acciones. Pero es movilización. Ahora hay gobiernos, países, continentes que están cero desalojos, casi. Digo casi porque en el mismo tiempo, a pesar de que se haya abierto un portal histórico, pandemia y también crisis climática, hay siempre el tentativo de regresar a la antigua normalidad. Es decir, que vayan, que las ONG, que alguna actividades se hagan, sin embargo, la dirección principal es otra, regresar a la antigua normalidad. Hago un ejemplo. El año pasado, como Alianza Internacional de los Habitantes, hemos examinado el juzgado dentro de la sesión del Tribunal Internacional de Desalojos, hecha entre Madrid, entre Santiago de Chile y Madrid, en paralelo a la COP25, hemos examinado distintos casos. Unos de, algunos de estos están una, un conflicto, un choque fuerte. Eh, hago un ejemplo. Alemania, el gobierno dice, vamos a salir de la, um, del nuclear y, sin embargo, necesitamos desarrollar las minas de carbón. Eh, desarrollar minas de carbón, uno, no es la dirección correcta. Dos, con esta política están desalojando, quieren desalojar 1.500 personas. Un ejemplo, claro, violaciones. ¿Por qué no están hablando de poner en debate, de contestar las fundaciones del modelo de desarrollo? Otro caso, que hay muchos de estos casos en Chile o en Argentina, con la, no, en Chile sobre todo, con la excusa de poner a salvo eh, asentamientos que están a, a riesgo, porque están construidos en zonas de riesgo, quieren desalojarlo, sin embargo, no es esta la solución, uno, Dos, en estas mismas um, asentamientos, áreas, quieren hacer otros proyectos de desarrollo especulativo o de infraestructura. Eh, hay un choque profundo, evidentemente. U, el último caso que estamos tratando en estos días, porque ya estamos logrando algún resultado. En Kenia, la foresta de Embubut, donde hay pueblos que están amenazados por un proyecto supuestamente para preservar la naturaleza con fondos europeos, se la llaman Tower, la, 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 la Water Tower. Eh, eh, así están desalojando muchísima gente que vive desde mucho tiempo, que son, ellos son los verdaderos que defienden la naturaleza. Entonces, es importante el enfoque del derecho humano, que ha sido destacado. Es importante que se hagan... Eh, eh, ejemplo, casos concretos, es importante que se logren alianzas, es importante
importante que, por ejemplo, cuando se habla de verdadera planificación participativa, me ha gustado mucho la intervención del ponente antes. Bueno, planificación participativa verdadera no es solamente derechos humanos, es aceptar también los conflictos. Y aceptarlo no como para reprimirlo o ponerlo de lado, sino para asumir las propuestas concretas que vienen de las poblaciones que se reexisten, decimos nosotros. O sea, resisten no solamente en este caso a la crisis climática, sino también a las políticas que quieren ser resilientes. No queremos ser resilientes, ya lo hemos dicho muchas veces. Es más importante ser reexistentes, es decir, resistir para reexistir, Exist otra vez, disculpen si soy un poco franco, eh, no queremos ser cucarachas, las cucarachas son resilientes, resistente quiere decir reponer, poner en debate totalmente las cosas, eh, han hecho la COP25, la COP26 va a ser el año próximo, a ver si hacia la COP26, con toda esta, esta movilización, con toda esta conectarse, con todas estas alianzas, logramos junto de hacer una fuerza porque se introduzcan algunos parámetros también, por ejemplo, el parámetro de desalojos, ¿no? ¿Por qué no hay un parámetro de desalojos? No solo, no muy sencillamente o meramente hablamos de enfoque de derechos humanos, que quiere decir todo y nada. Vamos a decir, si hacen un proyecto de eh, contra la, 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 la crisis climática, vamos a, hacer, a, vamos a ver si esto provoca. Termino. César. Vamos a ver si esto provoca o no. Terminado. Thank you so much. ¿Sí? Gracias. Chao. Thank you very much. I um, apologize for cutting you off. No, I'm no, very no, no. conscious that we um, we have limited time and I would like to be able to go back to the panel for their comments. Um, so that we can hear from them before we have to end the event. But thank you very much for the very, very rich comments that you've provided. So we will we'll go straight back to the panel now and uh, we'll start with uh, the UN Special Rapporteur, Mr. Raja Gopal. Um, if you would like to make some, in this case, um, reflections on what you've heard, but also closing comments uh, because we won't be able to come back again to you. So thanks. Hi, um, I, I, I know that we are really short on time, so I really don't want to take up any time for closing comments. It's been a very rich panel, and um, I look forward to, you know, uh, doing a deeper dive into the report and, um, uh, and to collaborate, of course, uh, with uh, many of you, as I have been doing, uh, particularly uh, the zero evictions campaign that was mentioned, I think, is a critical one at this stage. Um, and I also endorse the comments made by uh, Robert Lewis Littington. It's something that I've called attention to right from the day I took office in May, that uh, if governments could actually temporarily impose bans on evictions and then engage in various measures to protect tenants and then to do things that were politically seemed impossible to do until the pandemic hit us, there is no reason why they cannot you know, uh, adopt even those or even stronger measures to respond to the biggest crisis that humanity is facing, which is climate change. Uh, but the question of how do you actually generate that level of urgency to get governments to actually see the crisis of climate change the way they are seeing the pandemic right now? That is really the major task before us. Thank you very much. Um, would any of the other panelists like to make a fi final um, closing comments and respond to some of the, the reflections? Let, let, Francisco. Let me thank, uh, yes, Go ahead, let please. Me thank, yes, let me thank you, Lucy, Clara, and the other speakers for this opportunity. And, uh, you know, the conversation really brought up for me uh, affirmed certain, I think, very important points. Well, we all agree that the problem is going to be is, is worsening. And I'm very happy that uh, we look at this problem, the housing problem, as an issue of human rights, and particularly that it is a power relationship. And I think this is a very important thing that if we want this uh, problem solved, then we have to empower more and more the people. And I think the people themselves 
should be the ones to insist that they be empowered and all of these things. So uh, let me thank you for giving us this uh, opportunity to present that uh, idea. Thanks very much, Francisco. Yeah, I think that idea of um, empowering the people has come through in, in, in all the presentations. Um, Silvia, did you have any final comments? Sí, por favor, muchas gracias. Muy brevemente eh, reiterar en estas conclusiones en que creo que esto, estamos convencidos que el derecho a, a la vivienda adecuada, especialmente para las más vulnerables, debe ser una política garantizada en los gobiernos y que debe ser parte de la constitución política. En el caso del Perú no está así, ¿no? Y por lo cual pedimos al relator y a los representantes de Naciones Unidas nos puedan ayudar en ese gran desafío y que las poblaciones más vulnerables sean partícipes en ese proceso, por lo cual coincidimos totalmente para la reducción de lo que vienen a ser las amenazas del cambio climático y contamos con la gran colaboración de ustedes los organizadores en ese en ese en ese camino, en ese gran Eh, desafío, como dicen, en, est en estos nuevos escenarios de las nuevas, de la nueva ciudad frente a lo que nos ha desnudado la pandemia. Muchas gracias. Thanks a lot, Silvia. Uh, Dunya has in indicated that she will not take the floor further. <laughs> Is that right? Uh, Robert, did you? Okay. Thank you, Robert. Go ahead. I mean, I can just again to say thank you to the organizers. I don't want to burn up a lot of time on being polite, but I think it is uh, always uh, good to recognize when you're given a new audience and a new group to engage with. Um, I think just as, as one message that strikes me is that, that, you know, we have a fairly common understanding amongst a group like this. We're, give, we're talking fairly similar messages that impresses on me even more the need for us to work collectively to push governments to act in the way that we believe they should. They are, many of them are very well intentioned. They do want to see good outcomes, but they are not going, they are facing a lot of competing interests and they're not necessarily going to pay attention to our issues unless we push them to. And I think that pressure needs to be maintained consistently. Um, and I and I think many of them will will be willing to react positively to that, and and we need to keep the discussion going. And I think particularly in a number of areas, for example, as was highlighted, planning law is one that is a very classic one for me. It's been too close to shop within a profession saying, you know, we think we've got control of this. We do community participation, but it's very clear that the outcomes are not good enough at the moment. And we need to push for greater standards and greater accountability within that. I don't mean to click on the planners. There are many areas where we can talk about this, but I think a lot more needs to be done on saying, let's have some clear standards, clear accountability. Over, thank you. Thanks a lot, Robert. Robert, okay, so we will we'll wrap up there. Thank you to everyone for participating. Thank you in particular to all of our civil society partners who I mentioned earlier and to those who presented today and to Missouria. Uh, a big thank you to the special rapporteur. It's really important to have your voice in this uh, conversation. And I think you've really um, laid down the challenge to us now that, you know, how do we convince governments that this is an issue that's just as important um, as responding, for instance, to the COVID-19 crisis? You know, how do we get that same urgency um, amongst governments in terms of addressing uh, the housing issues that we're facing? So thank you very much. Um, please do go and read the report. We put the, uh, the link in the chat um, and it's been sent around. It's on our website. And as I said, there will be a little feedback back a box that pops up when you exit the meeting, feel free to put in your feed, uh, your comments um, on the report or on the panel or reflections that you had from our discussion today. Um, it's been a really enriching discussion. So thank you very much for all of your participation. Goodbye. Maybe just a short uh, remark that right. I just want to, um, <laughs> sorry, I just want to say sorry to everybody who posed questions because there were many questions in the
chat and in the Q and A, and um, we will take the questions with us. And you can always also direct um, your questions to us, write an email, and we will uh, see how um, we will um, upload the recorded event, and then uh, see also if there's any other opportunity for us to um, answer to your questions. Thank you for everybody who engaged and. Um, yeah, thanks, Lucy, for the moderation. And uh, sorry for interrupt the uh, goodbye, but that's what I wanted to yeah. say. Uh, okay, thanks Perfect. to everybody and uh, for joining this event. Bye bye.